Today's guest is a supporting sponsor of Liberty and Finance. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're delighted to have this first time guest. Gwen Preston is the Vice President of Investor Relations with West Red Lake Gold. You've met West Red Lake Gold twice on our channel before. We're gonna get a quick update on the amazing progress that's being made there. Gwen, thank you for joining us on Liberty and Finance this first time, today being Thursday, September 5th, 2024. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to uh, update everyone on everything that we're doing down at the Madsen Mine. And uh, that's exciting for our viewers because we bet we met both Will Robinson and Shane Williams uh, most recently at the Rural Conf Symposium on Natural Resource Investing in Boca Raton, Florida. That's where we, you and I met in person for the mm -hmm. first time. And we were, I was so excited <laughs> to bring West Red Lake Gold to our viewers because um, unlike many mining companies who are trying to get for out of exploration and development and into production, there's a long and winding road of timeline and permitting and everything that has to happen. A lot of those bridges have already been passed. You're going to give us an update on that. And it looks like there's a fast track towards production. Could you, uh, uh, maybe before that, if you could remind us of that uh, surprise Easter egg of finding some gold actually above ground when taking over the mill facility there, and then why West Red Lake Gold has confidence that there's a shorter path than most people have ever seen to production going forward. Yes, absolutely. Um, so just to, to touch on that Easter egg first, it's a, it's perhaps a good way to introduce the the project. So West Red Lake Gold bought the Madsen Mine project, um, which is in Red Lake, the western side of the province of Ontario in Canada. And we bought it because the previous operators there had made some mistakes and they would built the mine and only run it for 14 months. And then they had gone into receivership. They'd gone bankrupt. And then we were able to buy the asset for sort of pennies on the dollar that they had invested. Uh, they'd put $350 million into the project and we were able to buy it for about 40 million Canadian. Those are all Canadian dollars. And that was only 6 million of that was in cash. So it was a really amazing deal. And that deal really sets the stage for this entire company. This company was put together by Shane Williams, who is our president and CEO. He is a very experienced and successful mine builder. And then backing from Frank Joustra, who is one of the most successful you know, Canadian mining investors in, in recent decades. They came together, looked ahead and saw a, what they expect to be a very good gold bull market <clears throat> over the next little while. And they wanted to build a new Canadian gold mining company because the best way for investors to benefit in a rising gold market is through a company that is focused on growth, on rapid production growth. So pr producing more and more gold each year as the price of gold rises. That's the best way to give investors exposure, leverage to a rising gold market. But the thing is, it's hard to grow quickly. Just like you said, it takes a really long time to get from, especially exploration, discovery, permitting, engineering, financing, all of that, and into production. That, that's a 16 to 20 year process sort of at best. So when Shane and Frank saw the opportunity to buy the Madsen Mine project, it was just perfect because it was built, it stumbled, but a lot of the work that was done was good work. The gold is undeniably there. And it was a huge head start towards production for a team that has the ability and the capital, so the experience and the money to fix the things that didn't go well the first time around. So the Mads and Mine Project, that's what we're doing at the Mads and Mine Project. Now, relating to that Easter egg that you mentioned, one of the things that didn't go well with the prior operators is that they... the the sag mill, this is a big round thing where the rocks that are about three inches diameter at this point go in and they get smashed together with steel balls and this big thing that spins around and around. And that's what reduces it from like about three inches down to a sand sort of scale. Um, and there's a liner so that those things aren't smashing against the actual infrastructure of the mill. There's liners, there's sort of big concrete-ish liners that are in there and those things can be replaced so that they get beat up, they get replaced you, and then you carry on. The way that those liners were installed was improper with the previous operator. And so there was a bit of a gap between the shell of the sag mill and the liner. And gold is very heavy. So as this thing was tumbling around, the gold was sneaking through between the liner bits and ending up in the gap. And so when they were taking the mineralized material, the crushed up mineralized material out of the sag mill for further processing to get the rest of the gold out of that rock, they were actually un unknowingly leaving gold behind in that mistake gap in the sag mill. So 
when our group took over the mill, you, you take the whole mill apart, you make sure you understand all of it, you make sure that all of everything's clean and dry and, and ready. Um, and then they realized that there was gold stuck in there. So we brought in a specialist in mill cleanup and he, you know, went in there and recovered the gold that was left. So that was a was a, a, a fun benefit for sure, <laughs> was finding gold that was just already ready to go in the mill. We still have that at the refiner because it was sort of the way that it was mixed with sand means that it had to go to a refiner to, to mm -hmm. find out the exact amount. That's still in, in process. Nice benefit. But the bigger picture is that that is one example of many things that didn't go well for the prior operators. The Thankfully, the reason that we were keen to buy this asset is because Shane and the team, the technical team, went through, did a very deep research on this project and identified the things that they realized had gone wrong and, and had to make determinations about whether those were things that could be rectified. Were those fixable mistakes? And their answer was, yes, those are fixable mistakes. Now, there's no absolute guarantee in mining. You still There's still always going to be risk in mining. But if you can fix a bunch of things that you know went wrong the previous time, and if you know that the gold is there, and if you know that the gold does come out of the rocks well, because that's another challenge in mining sometimes, then you stand a good chance of being able to turn this mine back on effectively. And that's our whole goal. So we've been drilling the stink out of the resource. We know the resource is there, but this is veiny gold, very high grade, but it's it's not like a continuous ribbon of gold. There are sort of lenses in the ribbon. So you have to do a lot of drilling, six meter centers, six meter spacing between the drill holes to really know exactly where the gold is. So you can mine those lenses and not mine the rest of it. And that's how you're going to move rock to the mill that has the best gold grade possible. So lots of definition drilling, lots of mine engineering. So there's lots of options for where to mine. If this area isn't working for one reason, lots of other places that you can go. Proactive mine development. So you're not limited in where and how you can mine. New tunnel being driven to connect two sides of a mine so that we can have an efficient, smooth way of moving material around the, around the mine and out towards the mill. Other capital projects like building a camp, building a maintenance shop, building a mine dry where people can get ready for their shift before and after. These are all of the things that underpin an efficient mine. And these are these were capital requirements that the previous operator just didn't didn't do, didn't have the money to do and decided to decided to not do. And we are doing those things so that we can have we create the foundation for an efficient operation. And with all the infill drilling, the definition drilling, we create real confidence in knowing where the gold is. And because we already have this incredible mill, sure, there was a problem with the, the liners, but once you fix that, the rest of the mill worked incredibly well. So we have this mill that's already built, that's proven to work. We have all the permits. We have the tailings facility. We have a huge, huge head start in getting towards production. So yeah, we are gunning really hard to go from purchase to production in only two years, which is a very short time frame, um, like you said. So that's that's the the short of short version of a long story of all the things that are underway as we try and push this Madsen gold mine back into production in 2025. One thing you you said very succinctly there, but I want to emphasize it is you said the permits are in place and you went on and I, wait 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 permitting sometimes never goes through. Sometimes it takes ten to twenty years. There's there's often not only governmental involvement, but there's sometimes you depend uh, on the native communities and that sort of thing, you, they can be very complex. It can be very multi-dimensional. That's already in place. So that's, that's a huge thing. That's one of the reasons about the accelerated timeline. And that's where I wanted to focus next, if we could, about what happens as you go down that, and you mentioned risk reduction. You mentioned there's, there's always risk in mining, but a lot of these things have been fleshed out. And so uh, a lot of those risks that, that are uncertainties that Rick, Rick, rule always talks about what are the questions that you're trying to get answers to to re remove uncertainty because for one thing the marketplace awards a multiple uh to your potential earnings to value your company based on how much risk is still present there in in mm -hmm. in the view of the market and as you go down that curve toward from exploration to development 
to production, uh, the idea is risk goes down and therefore the multiplier that the market is willing to uh, to value your company at and your stock at goes up and up. And that's where the speed comes into play. Um, not only is it an emotional relief for investors, new investors coming in knowing that they're not going to have to wait forever uh, or get old, whatever, waiting for this thing to turn into a production productive mine, but that the uh, past behavior of normal markets is that there's this reward to investors who are in early before the, the risk is, is proven to be reduced. So can you talk to us about that, that uh, expected timeline uh, towards production and the risk reduction in the market multiples that are typical in the industry uh, along that timeline? Absolutely. So uh, interesting conversation. Just this morning, I was working with the team <clears throat> to create a new slide in our in our presentation you know the presentation that we use to convey when we're telling the story to interested parties is specifically about risk and we were talking through i was tapping the brain trust so to speak of all the people here at corporate and certainly over at the mine site because there's a, so much experience in mining and i was saying okay give me all of the examples that you can think of of mines that, that um, faced significant struggles during construction or during you know maybe early operations what were those what were those challenges um and the reason that i wanted to create that list is because we have we are in a very special situation for two reasons um the first is that we have very deep mind building experience so shane and the team that he's built have built or operated like dozens of very successful mines. And so their experience in mine ramp up means that they, the, as Shane will often say, he's like, it's all about identifying and doing what you can to mitigate all of the different risks in mining. And so that is basically the core of what we are doing right now is identifying risks and doing the work ahead, spending the money and doing the work ahead so that we can mitigate those risks. You can't ever erase them, but all you can do is understand them better and address them. So we're doing a test mining program so we can truly understand exactly which mining methods work in exactly which underground scenarios at this mine. This mine has been tapped before. So there's a bunch of different sort of scenarios underground, so to speak. So we're test mining. So we know what methods work where, how quickly the mining is gonna work, You know what the costs are gonna be for that mining. We want data. We don't want assumptions, we wanna operate on data. So that's one example. Um, the fact that this mine initially started operating in 1938 and has had several phases of operation in the many decades since means that we understand a lot of things that a new mine is having to guess about more like. So things like groundwater, things like rock competency, which determines like how much support you have to give when you're driving new tunnels. Um, things like uh, the reagents that are needed in the mill process. This mill ran, like I say, really well only a few years ago. So we have very clear and recent data on what the mill needs to operate, how many reagents it needs, how much how much um, grinding material it needs. So, so we have good data on all of that. We are currently developing underground right now. We've been underground for best part, for since, um, April, since October. So almost a year we've been underground. So we know exactly our costs and our requirements um, for underground mining. So we, the, the past history of operations, several stages of operations of this asset gives us a database that is just unbelievably valuable in mitigating risk because we have data instead of assumptions to work on going forward. And then when you layer on top of that, the amount of experience building and operating mines that's with our team, it's actually quite rare in the industry because a cyclical industry like mining loses its people. And so really deep mine building experience is not that common. So when you layer that experience on top of all of this data, you just get a really phenomenal opportunity to mitigate risk. And I know that may sound boring, a phenomenal opportunity to mitigate risk, but it's actually like fundamental, right? This like mining is about knowing where the gold is and then mitigating the risk of, of pulling it out of the ground to make sure that you make money. At the end of the day, that's what our goal is, right? And so it's really exciting, This thing, these two things coming together. I see it every day. I see it when I'm on site. Uh, it's very exciting. I'm like excited to put together this slide for our presentation that shows exactly all of the things that we're doing to address the risks in mining so that as we push towards production, now you ask about timeline. We are, our stated goal is to turn this mine on in the second half of 2025. We love 
the gold price right now, who doesn't love a gold price that's above $2,500 US, we would love to be in production right now. Um, and so if we if it becomes possible to turn it on sooner than the second half, we will push for that. Um, but we also don't want to turn on before we're ready. And ready means you know, you have the staffing, you have the safety culture, you have the mill testing, you have all of the data that you need, and you have enough drilling done that you have lots of stopes. Stopes are the areas that you actually mind. You have lots of stopes engineered and the access to those stopes either already done or engineered. You don't want to be scrambling to figure out where you're going to mine because you turned your mine on before you had done that work. So that's the balance that we're in right now. We really want to turn the mine on, but we need to make sure that we are ready and we have lots of mining optionality in hand, defined and engineered in hand before we do that. So it's a it's a between a rock and a hard place to use a, a, an oddly hilarious, an oddly appropriate <laughs> phrase. Um, but yes, we'd love to turn it on soon. The goal is absolutely the second half of 2025. And if we can best that, then we absolutely will. One of the things that I talked to both Will and Shane about when we interviewed them was the skepticism that I had because my inbox kept getting these progress reports and press bulletins and and press releases from West Red Lake Gold saying, oh, we crossed this goal. Oh, we crossed this goal. We passed this milestone. We accomplished this thing. And I thought, this is, you know, the old saying, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Probably so is, I, yeah. I kind of thought, okay, this is this is kind of like some of these, I don't, I don't want to be besmirched, but just like some I don't know, investment scheme, things where you, you see that, the, the, oh, this is get rich quicker or whatever. It's like, no. But when I met them and we talked about the situation and how it's a takeover of a previous operation that went sideways, and now with a more experienced uh, leadership and lessons learned from the past, uh, the errors of the past team, um, it, and the permitting already under, underway and every uh, already in, in hand, already complete, done, yeah. completed, that mm -hmm. um, this is the reasons why these milestones are flying past rather than crawling past as they do for most companies. Absolutely. So, and I would also say the deep access to capital. I mean, we've raised a hundred million dollars in our first year of existence, and we are likely to raise a little bit more money, not equity. We'll, we'll probably access debt, but the fact that this company has the ability to tap deep pools of money so that we could do the work, that's a, that's a real differentiator as well. Well, Gwen, it sounds like there's a, a cavalcade of reasons why West Red Lake's gold performance envelope is going to be much more uh, uh, rapid than most timelines associated with mining companies. It's going to be an exciting time. That's one of the reasons we're having you back on so soon. Normally, you know, some companies want to come on maybe once a quarter. It's only been a little over a month and a half since we had since we had uh, Shane on at the conference. So we're excited to get this update from you. If people want to find out more about West Red, West Red Lake Gold right now, where should they go? Absolutely. So <clears throat> the website is westredlakegold.com. And there is going to be a huge amount of news coming out over the next few months. We're going to be putting out the official mine plan. We're going to be tap accessing that last piece of capital. There's there's a lot that's going to be happening in the next few months. So I certainly encourage anybody who's, who's interested to visit the website or reach out to me. My contact is there. Um, and I love uh, answering questions and talking about what we're doing. Well, we're going to keep our popcorn popped and watching uh, here from the sidelines very excitedly and trying to bring this story on a recurring basis in front of our viewers and subscribers, because this is a story worth telling. It's it's extremely exciting. And uh, thank you for joining us this first time on Liberty and Finance. And we'll look forward to uh, learning more and sharing more about West Red Lake Gold in the near future. Thanks so much. I, I enjoyed it.